How is everyone? I'm sorry y'all have to put up with me late this evening. Ted does much better. And uh, we got much to be in prayer for. Let's get started with the word of prayer this evening. Now, ask Brother Jim Gales if you will open us up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be in your house this evening. Thank you for all the blessings bestowed on each and every one of us. Heavenly Father, we're here to sing praises in your name.
Charles Harris, Gail Harris. We take Chris Lane off. Uh, he's back at work. It seems like he's doing better. I don't know if they're still waiting on a urologist about his back, but overall he's good. Uh, remember uh, Diane Frey's family. Uh, she did pass away uh, yesterday. Uh, so remember her, or Monday, sorry. Uh, Miss Janet's mom. Uh, Will, Jamie McLawhorn, Jason Jocks, Anna and Baby, Zeke's friend. You take her off the list. All right. The Hammonds family, Amy and Rita Blackwelder, Lisa Jones, Kevin Linscom, uh, Jerry White, Tammy Knox's husband, Butch Farrington, Miss Naomi Riddle, Tanya Hughes, Scott Ward, Chuck Hughes, Lynn Cash, Tony Fish, Audrey Ingram, Cotton and Dickey Ketchum, Susan Curry, Apple Campbell, Jesse York, Ukraine, our missionary, Israel, our food pantry, the lost, our country and its leaders, our military and veterans, and the persecuted church. Is there anybody that we need to add to or take off? You just have Scott Ward off the list. All right, take Scott Ward off. Where you at? That was a long time ago.
And tonight uh, we're going to start in chapter number 11 where we'll deal about God's promise dealings with Israel. Um, and we'll be here for probably three or four weeks. And uh, so Romans chapter number 11 tonight, we know that God's dealings with Israel as promised was dealt with all sincerity. We know that God, first of all, uh, made promises to Abraham concerning the race of their family. He said he would be God's chosen people. And one of the reasons that, he, reason that Israel is listed as God's chosen people is because that is the lineage that he would send his son out of. And we see that, that he dealt with it on a race aspect. And then he dealt with it on a royal aspect when it comes to David. It's, and the, if you go back and study Matthew chapter number 1 and go through all the begets, and after you wake up, get through the first 20 begets there, uh, <laughs> um, and the book of Numbers, but you go into the book of, the, of Matthew 1, that is the lineage of David, which Christ came from. So God not only made his promise to the race of the nation of Israel, but he dealt, gave them a royal promise. And we know that these promises have not been canceled, but we know the royal promise has been postponed. Why? Because Jesus came to the earth the first time to fulfill a promise that he would come for all men's sin. The second time he comes back, he will come to fulfill a promise. Two promises. The first promise is to fulfill the royal promise when he becomes the king of the world, right? And in the new, in the uh, millennial reign, am I right about that? Have I got my timeline right? And the second promise would be the book of uh, John's gospel, chapter number 14, when he made a promise that he would come back to get us. So there's the three different promises that Christ is coming and the promises he made to the nation of Israel. Now, I want to give you something that will help you out a lot in the book of Romans chapter number 11. When you study Romans chapter number 11, Romans 11 is not written to the church. Okay? It's written to the nation of Israel. A lot of times, can I, I could meddle right here a little bit, can I? A lot of times we want to take scripture out of its context and want to apply it to today's life. That's not the way that we should interpret Scripture. We need to know the origin of the Scripture, why it was written, to whom it was written, and what it says word for word so that we can properly interpret it. If I taught Romans chapter number 11 tonight as taught to the church and taught of the church and said Romans 11 was written to the church, number one, I would be teaching it wrong. Number two, you, a lot of us would be confused on why we're, why we're reading and studying to the church what God has made promises to Israel. Does that make sense? So when we, get, when we study the scripture, it's important to understand what we're reading. We know that the Jew is God's earthly people, and we know the Old Testament is full of promises that God made to those people. And their promises are yet to be fulfilled. We know that God doesn't change his mind. We see in this chapter that Paul sets forth the fairness, the farsightness, and the faithfulness of God with his people, Israel. Tonight I want to deal, number one, with the fairness of God's dealings with Israel. And when we think about that, we see that Paul begins by showing that God deals with people on fixed principles. Moreover, his overruling government is ever mingled with grace. We can study how Israel drifted away from God, but God always has forgiven them and given him chance after chance after chance after chance all the way through the Bible. We can see that. So today, when we get here, we get to verse number one, and we see that Paul, when he's talking about the nation of Israel and God being fair to them, we see that Paul, number one, cites himself. Go with me to verse number one. When you find your place in verse one, say amen. amen. All right. I say then, hath God cast away his people? Paul asks a question, 
And Paul answered the question. Paul said, God forbid. And so if you put it in today's language, he would say, God has not forsaken us. And then he said, For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham. And notice this, he takes it a step farther. He lists a tribe. If I understand correctly, there were 12 tribes listed amongst the nation of Israel, right? We know that each of those tribes, if I remember correctly, surrounded the tabernacle at time of Passover, right? All right. So if you was of the tribe of Benjamin, then that's where you went. You were not segregated, but to some extent, that's how it was. I mean, just to be honest about it. But Paul said... I'm going to deal with this on a personal level. One thing I like about the teachings of Paul is this. Paul always preached the gospel, but he never said, that's what my pastor said, that's what my Sunday school teacher said. But Paul said, let me tell you about the personal experience of what God has done for me. Amen. And Paul was able to relate at this point that God hasn't given up on his people. Because God has converted once a man named Saul that is now the man Paul. And Paul at this point said, God has not cast away. So preacher, can Jews be saved? Absolutely. How are they saved? By the same grace and by the same God and by the same gospel that we are saved today. Why aren't a lot of them saved? Because they're blinded by their religion. But can I say something today? There's a lot of Baptists that are blinded by their religion. There's a lot of Presbyterians blinded by their religion. There's a lot of other denominations that are blinded by their religion. And that is the reason that they've not given their heart and life to Christ is because they're banking on their religion and their works to get them to heaven. Paul said here that God has not cast away his people. And God saved me. Paul later on um, writes about himself being the chief of sinners. In other words, I am the worst of the worst. If God can save me, God can save anyone. Today, friend, you and I, we may not have been murderers, we may not have been rapists, but we all are sinners. And tonight we have to realize that our sin is just as wicked and just as bad as anyone else's sin. And so when God saves us from sin and saves us out of our sin and saves us from the punishment of sin, he's saving you from the same punishment that he would give the murderer, the rapist, and all the other people. Even though you may not consider your sin that big, your sin is still sin. God did not die on the cross and say, all right, I'm going to shed an uh, eighth of my blood for this amount of sins. I'm going to shed a quarter of my blood for this amount of sin. I'm going to shed half of my blood for this amount of sin. And I'm going to shed all of my blood for this amount of sin because I'm going to label these sins bigger than the other. Sin is not a stair-step process. When God looks at sin, he sees all sin the same. Right. So moving on. Now Paul not only cites himself as an example, but in verse number 2 through verse number 10 tonight, we see that Paul cites history as an example. So Paul now is going to teach the history of why God has been fair to Israel. There is times in all of our lives tonight that we can take someone back in the history of our life and show them the kindness and the fairness of God to us. Amen. Somebody told me one time, said, God is unfair. And I said, you're exactly right. The most unfair thing that God has ever done to me is save me. If God had wanted to be fair to me, he would have sent me to hell. Am I right? Amen. If God wanted to be fair to all of us, the day we was born, he could have said, rejected, dead, and hell. Am I right? right? But God out of his mercy said, I'm going to send my son and I'm going to give him life, forgiveness, and heaven. And so when you think about God being unfair, remember 
that the unfairness of God is better than the fairness of God in some instances. So think about that. That'll, now, that's why Hebrews, I mean, Romans 11 is not written to us, it's written to the Jews. But when we think about the fairness of God, Paul deals with the history. So, preacher, what part of the history did God deal with? Verse number 2 through verse number 4. God hath not cast away his people, which he what? For new. So now Paul is dealing with the foreknowledge of God. Now, what is, uh, was it earlier in the book of Romans whom he did foreknow to him, them he did predestinate? Is that what your Bible said? Who did he foreknow? He foreknew the people of Israel. What ye not, the scripture, saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed a knee to the image of Baal. When we see this tonight, we see that Paul divides the Jews into two classes of people. He classes them a believing minority and a blinding majority. He wants his brethren to see that God's dealings with the Jews have been fair and consistent. Number one, God's dealings with the Jews, or Paul breaks them up into the believing minority. God's dealing with the Jews is dealing with the remnant. And that was based on his wisdom. Verse number two. God had not cast away his people, which he foreknew. A few weeks ago in the book of Romans, we dealt with the wisdom of God. And how God is an all-knowing God. He knows before the foundation of the world. He knows our for the past, the present, and the future. He knows everything. He knows what's going to happen at 7.24 p.m. At 3.30 today, he knew what would happen. Even though we didn't get a notification saying there was a tornado warning or anything. But God knew. It didn't take God by surprise. And tonight, the quicker that we learn about the sovereignty of God, and we learn that God is all-knowing, and is all-powerful, and is all-just, tonight it would help us as Christians to wrap our minds around the things of God. There are some things that we cannot understand when it comes to the biblical aspects because we were not, number one, we wasn't there. Number two, we have to read, in some instances, you have to read, I don't like to use this phrase when I'm dealing with the Bible, but in between the lines to get an understanding of how the writer of that book came to have what he wrote. Yeah, it was inspired by God, but it was in a different time frame. The wording may have been different. The action may have been different. So when we do that, we have to think ahead. But we see here that God's remnant was with his wisdom. Elijah's complaint against Israel was wrung from his lips in the darkest hour of personal depression. Can I say something right here real quick? I'm going to anyway, so I shouldn't ask. All right. Can I say tonight that depression is real? And that mental illness is real. Y'all agree with that? Yeah. And because a person is depressed does not mean that they have sin in their life. Y'all agree with that? Yeah. Because a person has mental problems does not mean that they are lost and undone without God. Yeah. Can I be fair right there? Several years ago, there was a group of preachers going around preaching that if you committed suicide, you wasn't saved. Okay? The act of suicide is very selfish. 
I understand why people do it. I don't know, you don't, you can never comprehend what would take a person that far in their darkest hour. But they get to a point that they feel like that all hope is gone and they feel like the best thing to do is leave this earth. What they forget about is their friends and their families who always question why. Unless they leave a long written out note explaining everything that's going on. And some people do. But a bunch of preachers preached that up until about eight, nine years ago when they found a preacher who had just finished up a revival meeting outside of his hotel with a gun shot to his head several times. And at that point, they all started changing their mind. Because at that point, they all had to say, well, that person really wasn't saved and that he went to hell because he killed himself. That's not the fact. And Elijah here, or Elias, was depressed over the state of affairs that was going on amongst the people that was around him. And you can find that in 1 Kings 18 and 19. When, when he said, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars. I am left, notice this, what does he say? Alone. A person that is depressed, a person that is struggling spiritually, physically, and mentally will be in the same boat that Elias was in here when he said, I am alone. Are you with me this evening? No. And because of that, he said, Lord, they seek my life. Elias here was open with God about the problem that he had. And if you are going through depression, if you are going through the darkest hour of your life, if you can't be open with your pastor, if you can't be open with your friends, be completely honest and open with God and say, God, this is where I am at. And talk to God like he doesn't have a clue what is going on in your life. You say, preacher, that's crazy. God knows everything. Yes. But, it is our responsibility to ask God for his help. If you come to me and say, I need help at my house. Can you help me? And I say, what kind of help? I just need help. Well, do you need help moving? Do you need help with your plumbing? Do you need help with your electrical? What do you need help with? And you never can specify exactly what you needed help with. You know what I'm going to say? Good luck. Find somebody else. <laughs> I don't just drive up to someone's house who says that they need help and they not tell me specifically what they need help with. Tonight, a lot of us are going to God saying, God, we need help, but we're not specific with God telling him in what areas we need help with. Elias here went to God and said, God, if we can put it in today's words, God, I'm in the darkest hour of my life. God, there's been other prophets killed. God, they've tore up the altars. There's no worship here. So God, they, the prophets have been destroyed. The altars have been destroyed. And God, now they're looking to destroy my life. Elias here was very open with God. Very specific in his details. And tonight, you and I need to be the same. But notice this. When he was specific with God, God became specific with him. Preacher proven. Verse number four. But what saith the answer of God of him? Paul again asked a question to the people of God, saying, Hey, what did God say? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed a knee to the image of Baal. Tonight when we think about the remnant of people that God has, we must remember that you and I are not the only ones serving God. 
You and I are not the only ones who come to church. You and I are not the only ones who are right in our worship. God has a remnant of people. Monday evening, Mike decided that he wanted to ride with me uh, to supper. I don't know why he wanted to ride with me. We had to go to Cornelius, too, so I had to take him down 77. You know what some selfish person did on 77? They had to have a wreck right in front of the exit that I needed. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to go all the way down and turn around and come all the way back up because they decided that that was the best place to have a wreck. They did a good job, too. I mean, they turned the car over, put glass on it, and everything. I mean, they did a really good job. All right, that was terrible. I want to tell you. But me and Mike was talking, and I was <clears throat> talking about the book of James and how the book of James is overlooked. And I took, I, I said, if you listen to my latest podcast, he said, no. I said, well, let me tell you what the last one was about. I said it was, a, it was about discrimination amongst Christian brethren. And I said, I believe today as Christians that we discriminate and we forget that we're all a part of the family of God. We may discriminate against someone because they're not a Baptist or they're not a Methodist or they're not a Presbyterian or they're not a Lutheran or they're not an Episcopalian. We may fret, we may we may discriminate against someone over the version of Bible that they use. We may discriminate over someone by the type of music that, they're, that they listen to or their church sings. At the end of the day, if they've accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, then they're a part of the family of God. And Paul, when he wrote here, saying, God said, I've reserved to myself 7,000 men. He didn't tell Elias, they're all men that are thinking like you. But he said, they're all men who have not bowed at knee to Baal. In other words, they stood for what they believed in. They may not be the same color. They may not carry the same Bible. They may not sing the same song. But at the end of the day, they stood against the world and made a stand for God. And if a person can stand against the world and take a stand for God, we shouldn't discriminate against them as Christians. Amen. Right. Moving on. So we get here that God showed grace to Elijah. God came and dealt. When we get into 1 Kings 19, verse 14. God wrote, I'm a very jealous, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken my covenant, thrown down my altars, and slain my prophets with the sword. And I, even I, am left. They seek my life to take it away. And then you get over to verse number 15 and 16. And the Lord answered back and said, Anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. Jehu, the son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, to be the prophet in thy room. God said, here is some men that you can go to on a personal level and say, thus saith the Lord, and they're going to accept exactly what you say. So your life is not over. Your life may be in the darkest place, but I still want you to be faithful. Tonight as Christians, God only requires us as stewards to be found what church? Faithful. I'm sure that Elijah had some questions. Why wasn't God in the tempest, the earthquake, or the fire? Why were not these effective instruments placed into the hands of Elijah? Why God did not send his servant back with a fresh commission against prophets of the grove? 
Elijah's anger had been kindled not against Jezebel's prophets, but against Israel, the people of God. And God said, get your eyes off the negativity of Israel and put them on back on what matters. Tonight, church, we're so focused on the wickedness and the corruption of this world that we have lost sight of the goodness of God. We can look around in this world and we're doing just like Elijah did. Lord, I'm the only one that's serving you. God, I'm the only one this. I'm the only one that. And God said, why are you angry at your own people? I've got 7,000 men that's not bowed a knee to Baal. Don't be angry at your own brethren. You should be angry at the people who are walking against and doing the things against God. Notice this, Elijah, if you study out the book of 1 Kings, unlike Moses, did not intercede for the nation of Israel, but Elijah cried out for a war against his own people. That's how angry he was. When we think about that, we know that believing was a minority. The prophet complained, I reserved my, or God answered back and said, I reserved myself 7,000 men that's not bowed a knee to Baal. As it was in Elijah's day, so it was in Paul's day and always has been, God never leaves himself without a remnant of the people. There have been times in the history of the church, as it was with Israel, when the lamp of the testimony has burned dim, but has never Tonight, when we think about that, we just need to remain faithful. Paul dealt with the believing minority and God's wisdom. But now, Paul takes us over to verse number 5 and verse number 6, where he deals with the finished work. But even, verse number 5, when you find your place there, say amen. amen. Even so, then, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of what, church? Works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. When we think about this, God's remnant has always been those who have accepted salvation by grace through faith. Right. The first followers of Christ were at the one and the same time the last believing remnant of the old community and the first nucleus of the new community. When we think about that, we see here that the believers here are always in the minority. Standing for God is never popular. Praying is never popular. Preaching is never popular. Singing is never popular. But there's one thing about it. We're in this together as a small remnant of people. And just as God has not turned his back on the nation of Israel, he will not turn his back on you and I that serve him. Now, Paul shifts his focus. It's starting in verse number 7 from the, from the believing minority. Everybody good on the believing minority? You ought to say amen. All right. Now we're going to go to the blinded majority. Go with me to verse number 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were what? Blinded. When we think about this, we see that God had his Gulf Spurt stream of believers in Israel. There was also an ocean of the nation called the unbelieving 
majority. The picture that Paul gives of the nation as a whole is sad. He speaks of the search, the unfailing search of the nation. The word, the word blinded in the last part of verse number 7 would be the same word that you and I would use today as hardened or callous. When we think about that, it is used in the Gospels to describe the Pharisees who were angered at the Lord for healing a man in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. It is used later by Paul to describe the unconverted Gentiles who walk in the vanity of their mind, having understanding darkened or hardened. In other words, God will turn their, heart, will turn their hearts hard. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. You can find that in Ephesians 4.17. The great business of the Jewish nation was its search after righteousness. The passion of the Greek was for knowledge. The passion of the Roman was for power. But the passion of the Jew was for righteousness. They missed their national goal. You know why? Because they missed Christ. They were so busy looking for righteousness that when Christ was born into a manger, they missed it. When Christ went to a cross to die for our sin, they missed it. When Christ rose again on the third day, they missed it. When Christ ascended into heaven with the promise that he would return again, they missed it. Because they were so focused on trying to keep the law that they missed the hell of God. Who put them no longer under the law, but put them under grace. And because of that, at this point, God has blinded them or hardened them, except for the remnant. Think of how many Jews and Gentiles were saved under the ministry of Paul. Paul. I wish sometimes God would, would have, when he wrote his Bible, I know it's perfect, I know it's the perfect inspired word of God, don't get me wrong, but like, in the Bible, I wish it told X amount of men trusted Christ under the ministry of Paul. It would probably blow our minds how many men and women got saved under his ministry. I wish he did it throughout everyone's ministry. But today, friend, that is not what matters. You know why? Because that would take away from the greatness of God. Because we would be focused on how great Paul was in his ministry that we would forget it was the grace of God that saved those men. Right. Are you with me? Paul was just an instrument ready to be used by the hand of God. Then we get into verse number 8. According as it is written, God has given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that should not see, and that ears that should not hear unto this day. Miss Elka came into church tonight. You're never like this. Miss Elka came into church tonight and said, My throat's sore. And I said, Why? She said, Hans can't hear. So I've been screaming at him all day. And I said, Huh? And she said, Hans can't hear. I said, huh? And she slapped me. <laughs> but God said, I'm going to put them in a spirit of sleep. I'm going to cause them to sleep through the important things. And I'm going to deafen their ears. When we think about that, we see that Paul speaks of the stupor of the nation of Israel. The nation has become so insensible to spiritual realities that it became a subject of judicial hardening. Paul has already cited his dealings with God's dealings with Pharaoh as an example of judicial hardening. Isaiah speaks very solemnly of similar doom for Israel in Isaiah 29:10. 10. 
In a coming day, God will deal with the apostate in the same way in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. As leprosy renders the flesh insensitive, so the soul of the Jewish nation has been rendered insensitive to Christ. Paul dealt with the stupor, verse number 9. And David saith, let their table be made a, what church? Snare. And a trap. And a stumbling block. And a recompense unto them. Paul not only deals with the stupor of the nation, but Paul also speaks of the snare of the nation. In the holy place of the tabernacle of Israel was a table. Israel high, Israel's high and holy privilege was to eat with Jehovah at his table. A privilege not reserved for priests alone, but in their peace offerings for the people as well. You can find that in Exodus chapter number 24, verse number 11. Leviticus chapter number 6, verse number 16. And Leviticus chapter number 7, verse 18 through 20. In their feast days also Israel sat at table, so to speak, with Jehovah. This is the highest, holiest, and happiest of all national privileges, but became a snare to the nation of Israel in its unbelief. Why? Because they became more occupied with the outward ceremonies than with the spiritual reality. They became so occupied with the traditions and the privilege that they had that it became a snare to them that hindered them. Tonight, we have people who have put their focus in the, I'll, I'll call it out, the Baptist movement, that the way that they dress, the music that they listen to, the Bible that they use has become nothing but a snare to them that keeps them from moving forward in the things of God. Moving on, verse number 10. What, do you, what else do you see? Verse 10. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. Paul not only deals with the stupor of the nation, the snare of the nation, but Paul in closing deals with the servitude of the nation. The bowing of the back, the loosening of the loins is a vivid picture of servitude and fear. From generation to generation, Jew has fled from land to land, ever pursued by the vicious curse of anti-Semitism. The national rejection of Christ has brought its own train, untold miseries from age to age, from Hitler's death camps, have been one high tide mark in the sorrows of the nation. From what is written on the prophetic page of Scripture, we know that those horrors will not be the last. For still ahead of the nation are horrors of the great tribulation. After final agony, however, God will pour upon the household of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. They shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day there shall be great mourning in Jerusalem and as the mourning of Hadrimon in the valley of Megiddo and the land shall mourn every family apart. And that was Zechariah chapter number 12 verse 10 through 12. So we see here the fairness of God in his dealings with Israel is to the believer minority who found favor in the sight of God and have been added to the church. The blinded majority has tasted that judicial hardening and the blindness which the nation was forewarned by the prophets. Notice this tonight. What was prophesied in the Old Testament to the nation of Israel as came to pass. And Paul, to get his point across, went back to the Old Testament and said, hey, this is what the prophet said. 
let me take you back to what was written. This is what happened. This is what was said. This is what was done. And now look where you're at. You're right in the middle of those prophecies. The same thing is happening today, church. We've got prophecies that are being fulfilled right now as we speak in the Bible. But a lot of us are walking around blind just like Israel is because you and I are so focused on everything that we're doing that we've forgotten about the things of God. So that is God's promise dealing with Israel part one. Any questions, any comments, any concerns on the lesson tonight? All good? Did I teach that good? Or are you that confused? Clear as mud? Okay, good. <coughs> All right. We look forward to we seeing. We have a spirit of slumber. Oh, is that what it is? <laughs> My wife looks like she took a nap over there. Did you take a nap? Okay. All right. No, I was good. Okay. All right. I did look out the congregation Sunday morning, and I'm not going to tell you where. I'm not going to tell you who. If they're watching, they'll know who I'm talking about. Or they may be here. They'll know who I'm talking about. But Sunday, see, y'all don't think I see things because y'all think I look ugly when I preach because I don't look directly at you. Oh, I see a lot when I preach. But Sunday, I was up here preaching my heart out, and I looked over in the church, and somebody was like this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not lying. If I could have took a picture, I would have. Does that bother you? No. That just means they have great confidence that what I'm saying is going to be the truth. <laughs> Could say that I'm that boring too. <laughs> but uh, all right, if our free this evening, for good say amen. <coughs> amen. We dismiss with a word of prayer, and I will call on Brother John Munson to close us out of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you.